Hi, I'm David Coles. I'm the founder of Language Artist Colours. We're an independent colour house in Melbourne, Australia, specialising in professional grade artist oil colours. I'm at the Jackson studio to talk a little bit about my story. My background before I started making artist oil colours was an artist. I went to art school at Bristol, uh, what was then Bower Ashton Art College, and studied for four years in painting. Because Bristol had a lot of emphasis on making materials and understanding the materials that artists were working with, I had an introduction to a broader range of materials than maybe a lot of artists or certainly students may have been exposed to. So we were making encaustics stretching our own canvases, making our own stretcher frames. So that was my background in training. I then became a professional artist, but of course I had to get second jobs to pay the rent, put food on the table. And for that reason, um, I ended up working in art retail. I'd done that when I was a kid because my parents had opened an art shop in Henley on Thames in Oxfordshire, which is where I was born and bred. And so I already knew that industry, plus of course being an artist, I knew the materials to a, a great extent, or what I thought was a great extent at the time, and was able to fit into a job working in, in retail, art material retail um, in London. The big break for me, uh, in a sense, because of the education, was, the, was working at Cornelison's in London, which obviously is a very important historic art store with a fantastic history to it. Uh, and. Um, there I was really trained up in the, in the traditional sense in knowing that my materials. I think it's important for, for anyone working in art store to understand the materials that, um, your, that artists are working with so you can give good advice. And it's very much been the basis of everything that we've ever done at Langridge ever since, which is, again, to support our customers with that technical support. Serendipitously, I took what I thought was going to be a few months off to travel to India and Nepal. I think in, literally I'd put set aside three months. That all went swimmingly and I met some people and they said, oh, you've got to go to Thailand. And I went with them to Thailand. And then I realized I wasn't quite ready to go back to the UK. And I was able to get a working tourist visa for Australia. Obviously, I needed to earn some money. And I went down to uh, Melbourne. I knew some people um, who I've been traveling with who, who lived in Melbourne. I think I arrived on a Saturday. The paper had all the job ads. There was a job for an art shop in that Saturday paper. I had the interview on the Tuesday. I started on the Wednesday. And I worked for that art shop for the whole year that I had in, in Australia. And from there, I had to come back to Britain because it was a one-year uh, working visa. And I worked uh, again with Cornelisons, who were very generous in knowing at uh, a later point in that uh, employment that I was going to go back to Australia and set up Language Artist Colours. I didn't know the name of the company at the time. And I wanted to come back to Australia to do that because in that year I was there, I realised there were only a couple of, of our manufacturers. And Australian artists, I believe, deserved a more choice and also what I felt was better quality. So there was a lot of imported product, very fine product, but it seemed that Australia should have its own premium, you know, manufactured oil paints. And that's what I really wanted to get into. I went back to Australia, emigrated to Australia and um, set up Langridge in November 1992. And we really got cracking properly in manufacture at the beginning of 93 and really we haven't stopped since then. Slowly growing, it's very difficult when you start with very little money. Wish I had a larger amount of money when we started, and that would be certainly some advice to anyone looking at setting up their own small business. Just make sure you've got some money behind you. And everything that we, we made, of course, we put back into the business. But it was also incredibly fun times because, in a sense, we were free from any um, preconditions, any uh, understanding. We were so fresh and new and we were young, um, and we had a great time. It's not to say we're still having a great time now, but it's a different type of business now, so. Well, 
wow, yeah, that's one of those big things. When you're starting, you make your own company. It's like, oh, what are we going to call ourselves? It was because we started the, the first factory was in Langridge Street in Collingwood, which is in Melbourne. So we just named it after the street. I also like the name because it had a kind of stability to it and slightly English feel about it. So it felt like something that I could travel with um, even if we moved uh, factory spaces, which of course we have done. We've moved to now to a much larger, much larger factory over in Yarraville in the west of Melbourne. Yeah, it just felt right. It just felt, it just felt the right name, so yeah. Uh, language has 12 in the team because we're a manufacturer. Um, of course, it's based on the actual labor um, on, the, on the factory floor. We have a decent uh, management team, um, but certainly we put a lot of effort to have people who are trained up. Um, of course, you, you know, in regards to, say, being a paint maker, um, there's nowhere where you can go and learn that. Um, so that's all done in-house. And we also have staff who are specialized now in varnish making or in the mediums making um, or uh, pigment decanting and they obviously have other responsibilities making sure the pigments are in stock. We now supply 150 pigments. We manufacture 72 oil colors. Very soon is going to be uh, 80 colors. We're releasing eight new colors. We're always, you know, sort of trying to increase our, uh, our labor base, our, our staffing because we are growing and it's, um, you know, in the last few years, we've seen a, you know, a, a big growth in, in, in demand for our product, which is very gratifying, um, especially because we're a young color house. We don't have the history of some of the older color houses from Europe. And I think that's part of one of our success is because we're not constrained by history. We can build our color range and our whole ethos around a, from, from scratch. Um, and also, of course, we're in Australia, which is one of the youngest modern nations in the world in regards to uh, the European um, settlement. Um, but of course, it's also home to the oldest living culture in the world with the Australian First Peoples. It's important that we recognize that at Langridge, even though most of the materials that we sell are not being used in the art practice of Australian Aboriginal peoples. They're mostly using acrylic paints. Um, but we certainly still work quite closely with communities across the country and always have done for the last 30 years. So Langridge has definitely grown exponentially, in particular in the last 10 years, um, through demand, through people trusting us. Um, and we hope to continue that growth, basically, yeah. I think the biggest thing, more than anything else, is being um, the product is available to more people around the world than ever before. Business has had to grow in regards to its staffing, in regards to the quantity of material that we're actually selling. But probably the biggest change would have been around about 11 years ago when we finally released our um, oil colors. Because for the first 20 years or 18 years, uh, Langridge didn't make uh, an oil color. We made a full range of artists oil mediums, but we didn't make oil paints. And the reason for that is because you need a triple roll mill. You need some equipment that's very expensive. And we bought it on the second hand market, um, but still a lot of money. And we just couldn't afford to do that until a period of, as I said, around about 11, 12 years ago. With the release of the oil colors that centered us, it allows us to really sort of get into um, art stores uh, around Australia because we had a product that really in the end, most artists want. They want to paint. It's probably the most important thing. And things like mediums, uh, etc are obviously ancillary they're important or they can be important but they're not as important as the actual color the oil color itself and one of the things that um, again liberated me by setting up in australia was that i wasn't held back by the european traditions um, and obviously it wasn't held back by any history. I mean, we were literally starting from scratch in 92. And one of the things I wanted to do was build a, a color range that was, I suppose, contemporary. It was 21st century. When I went to Australia, I was incredibly aware of the light over there. It's a much bigger sky. It's much brighter. There's far less moisture in the air. So the, the, the light is almost crackling. It, it strikes objects and it bounces back with a with a kind of a cr uh, chromatic intensity that we don't quite get generally in Europe and certainly not in northern northern Europe um, or the United States. 
And allied to that was also looking at some of the acrylic paint brands, uh, in particular, um, Golden Artist Colors, who I have a very long and strong relationship with. And I wanted to have colors that they were offering in a way, or what more importantly, that their colors were sometimes candy or almost plastic. They were colors that were represented or analogous to the world around us. So as I said, things like colors generated by computer screens or by film, colors generated by synthetic foods and plastics. Because artists, you know, can always manipulate those colors, isn't it? If they want to use them in that straight form, that's fantastic, but they can move them around as, as artists will do. I wanted to offer these, these colors that was completely unique, that wasn't following what the, the European color houses were doing, which built out of their history, you know, there's a very strong emphasis on the natural ochres, which we do offer, but not to the same breadth because we want to concentrate more on the modern pigments in particular. So many of those pigments that um, are in artist paints, but often hidden because of the naming convention. So words like permanent or hue or substitute are used. We like to actually put the name of the specific pigment in our on our label and the actual you know branding or the, the naming convention. So we will call it quinacridone or thalocyanine or aralide or dioxazine benzamidazolone, which is the next generation organic yellow pigments. And so all of these colors I wanted to introduce and celebrate. I mean, celebrate their high performance. They, 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 they are far higher performance in regards to their light fastness, their color intensity, and their chromatic purity to many of the colors from the 19th century and earlier. And so I want to build not only from pigments that are incredibly high high performance, but also celebrate a color palette that is from the 21st century and make us stand out from anyone else. Now I can tell you that they are 100% vegan and which paints wouldn't be vegan? Which paints would have obviously an animal product or an animal byproduct within them? The two components that we would be looking for and if you are interested, would be certain pigments, very few in this day and age, but basically bone black, sometimes would be called ivory black, but that will be a bone black. So of course that's from charred bones. Um, there are more historic colors that really aren't in paint makers palettes anymore. They used to be carmine made from cochineal. Quite often we'll need to put a stabilizer in to prevent pigment oil separation in storage. In other words, whilst the tube is sitting in an art shop, sitting more likely in your studio, Pigments want to come back together. So they want to rem remove themselves, separate themselves from the binding oil. So we have to put a stabilizer in just to prevent that. We put it in very, very small quantities. Now there are many stabilizers on the market. Some are synthetic and some are natural. We use at Langridge either aluminum stearate at its optimum level, which is ridiculously small, or we may use a small amount of castor wax. But some makers, and certainly historically, traditionally, would use beeswax. And so that would be another reason why maybe it was a non-vegan paint. These are things that I can think of that, that might be of interest and certainly that are important to, to many artists and just wanted to point it out. So I can say that Langridge oil colors are 100% vegan oil paints. Langridge is a color house dedicated to oil color. Um, I'd rather concentrate be the best that we can in one media. And I have the biggest obsession and love with oil paint. I'm an oil painter myself. So of course I have the most intimate understanding of that media more than any other. So when the paint is you know, coming off the mill, I can feel it and I know through thousands upon thousands of hours working that paint um, over different batches over the years, I know what to look for. I know if there are, not there are problems, but just obviously we're not quite there yet because when we're making the paint, we don't have a process that's led by just, you know, one, two, three, although it's very um, formula based. When it comes to the final paint milling, that has to be done on the feel that comes from the paint coming off the mill. And that only comes with experience. And that can change due to, well, probably most importantly through temperature through the time of the year. So paint making in winter is actually a little bit harder than paint making in the summer. Everything is a little bit colder, everything's a little bit stiffer. Pigments don't want to be dispersed on the mill quite as easily. 
we could cheat that by adding in additives, wetting agents, etc., dispersing agents in quite you know in larger quantities. But of course, they will denature the final paint. We refuse to do that. So if that means a paint has to be run through the mill 13 times, we will do that until the paint comes off the mill correctly. And as I said, that's the obsessive quality I have about making oil paint. And I have been to other paint makers and I've seen in particular, you know, acrylic paint being made. And it's a science. It's a different type of, of paint making at the highest end. It's something that we would have to you know, we just wouldn't be interested in. I, I like the visceral quality of oil paint making. It's almost like being, to be honest with you, like being a chef. It's it's almost cooking with colour, as it were. To long-winded answer, oil paint and only oil paint. It started that I actually wasn't writing the book. What happened was in 2017, I was very happy with what was happening with language and as I had always imagined language was going to be a contemporary colour, but it meant that I was leaving behind a lot of the histories of colour, which I am fascinated by, in particular because they are so intimately connected to the the, the human experience. You know, that these are colours, it's one of the, it seems to be one of the earliest traits of human experience or, or civilization. that's probably too, too um, specific a word, but something where, by which from the earlier stages, um, humankind has wanted to use uh, mark making to, if nothing else, sort of say, I was here. And of course, that means they're collecting colour from around them, from the most basics being obviously the ochres and chalks, through to the ancient Egyptians and onwards with actual synthesised colour, or taking raw materials and actually reacting them or cleaning them or combining them to create secondary colours. I made a decision that we would put an exhibition on about the origins of colour. So we created Chromatopia, the history of colour, as in a museum style exhibition. And when I say museum style, I meant that I wanted it to feel, look and be experienced by, by the general public as though they were going into a, a museum, something that I was amazed had not really been done before. We worked with a gallery that let us take over the whole space, that was nine rooms and put together a complete history from the earliest colours all the way through to the most contemporary colours and, and explain where colour comes from. First of all, to reveal to the public that colour comes from something that I think we often don't realise that colour is born from an actual physical material. It's not, it doesn't just suddenly appear. It's not like light. Um, it was an absolute labour of love. There was no commercial reason for doing it. We put the money together from language, paid for the full exhibition. So the numbers of people that came through was extraordinary. We had people coming, flying in from interstate. We had queues first thing in the morning of 30, 40 people. Um, I gave talks on the weekends. I was talking to 300 people. They couldn't fit them into the gallery. And from that, Thames and Hudson came and saw the exhibition and were sold and approached me and said we'd love to see this turned into a publication and so we did. I had a lot of control over it, obviously we had an editor and I didn't want this to be a book that was too um, dense, too in-depth. I wanted it to be almost a primer on colour so that people could get an understanding, an, an entry point, an, in, an interesting and hopefully enjoyable entry point into the history of colour. Yeah, I wrote the book in three months, that's three months obviously plus you know, 40 years worth of, of knowledge. You know, we've basically got Chromatopia in three English language editions. So there's Australian, British, and American. And we also have it in eight international language editions, including China. There are other, some, there are some other great books on, on color as well. I, I, you know, and I admire those as well. And I also obviously have them in my own collection, but I wanted this very particular way of, of presenting color to, to everyone so that they would celebrate colour and realise actually how important it is in our lives. When I was making the Chromatopia exhibition and when I was writing the book, I made a lot of those pigments from scratch following historical texts. So by doing that, I would understand the actual, one could say, alchemy of colour, certainly understand the um, technological 
what the word I'm looking for, the, how ingenious uh, you know, humankind have been in being able to extract color or convert color from what, what may have seen something quite unassuming. I'm thinking about, say, something like rose madder, a pigment that is a dye drawn from the, the roots of this, of this plant, from the madder plant, which is endemic really to sort of um, central, well, to, to Turkey and uh, the Mesopotamian Iran, Iraq area. Um, although, of course, it's been grown all over the world. And drawing out the dye and then converting that, turning that into a lake pigment. A lake pigment is whereby we react it normally with an alkali and colour is precipitated out as an actual pigment. And that colour is exquisite because, you know, it's one of the very few genuine pinks actually available. And also in the making of it, you get these little side things that you hadn't realised. Rose madder actually smells of strawberries, which I love. You sort of feel like this is a natural colour and you can actually smell the naturalness of it. It very much engendered a, a greater sort of um, belief in colour and, and a recognition of the extraordinary efforts made to get colour, especially when we talk about colour prior to the, the revolution in science of modern science in the 18th century, where before then we didn't really understand the nature of, of chemicals. We didn't understand there were elements. So much of it was done by trial and error, by um, accident, um, and then refined over centuries. Um, and I've been very lucky to travel the world to find these colour makers all over the world who were still doing they, these processes of making these, these traditional colours, these traditional pigments and dyes in, in methods that they've been using for 500, 600 years. Even though I'm working a lot with modern pigments, it still makes me realise how much effort has gone into you know, refining this idea of colour and creating something that also, of course, has value to artists. I mean, colour is important, but in the end, it's really a tool for the artist. We take the colour, we make it into a paint that is used by artists to create art. That's, of course, in the end, its final function. But it's important that we can make the, the best quality possible, and that means sourcing the best quality, and that means we understand how they've been made so we can make the right selection. The best story I can tell you about, and it changes, a year from now I will be giving you another story, or giving everyone another story, um, about what's my favourite pigment in regards to the story behind it. My favourite pigment at the moment, in the sense of the story behind it, would be that in 2018 um, I went with Louise, my wife, um, who's an artist, and we wanted to go to Nara in Japan to see the uh, Sumi Ink manufacturer. The company's been in the same family for uh, 500 years. They're using the same processes for making the ink sticks um, from 500 years ago. Um, it's a very ancient tradition. And they are unique, this company, in regards to they actually make the lamp black pigment as well in-house. In Japan, it's called susu, which is basically soot, soot black. In this beautiful space which is very traditional courtyard with the rooms around it not only is it incredible watching the ink makers knead the uh, glues with the actual lamp black pigment of course what I was most drawn to was the actual lamp black making itself and in a small windowless room around about 14 maybe 18 foot by about six foot are arranged uh, running shelves two running shelves all the way around and on those shelves are bowls filled with oil and handmade wicks. And on top is a small bowl that collects the soot. And this one gentleman is in China. each room, and there are three rooms, and this room has 200 of these, these lamps. And the susu maker, his job is to all day keep rotating the, the bowl so that the, lap, the soot black collects evenly. He also makes all of these uh, wicks by hand every day. He makes 200 to 300 a day, which are then used for actually making, so obviously for burning, and then making the soot. And soot from a candle is because um, it's imperfect burning. It's not a perfect burn. If there was a perfect burn, there'd be no soot. It has, it's actually imperfect burning, and it's collected as a vapor soot on the top, and it's then um, scraped off, and then of course used as the actual black pigment used in the actual sumi ink make and sumi ink stick making. 
quite unbelievably medieval in one way. And when we walked in, this extraordinary smell of burning oil, quite acrid, um, but quite rich as well. And also quite spiritual to see all those. It reminded us, of course, also of things like Buddhist temples, uh, these lights of the, the candles of the, of the wicks burning away. Quite, quite extraordinary. And, and to understand how much effort's put in just to be able to make that lamp black pigment. So that's this year's favorite story. It's actually pretty difficult because really there are very few pigments that are completely obsolete. They may not be used much, um, but they are still available. I mean, probably because of the artist Vermeer, I've always been in love with lead tin yellow. It's a very sweet yellow, it's made from lead and from tin. So obviously to a certain extent, it has a toxicity to it and, obviously, and has fallen out of favor and replaced by modern pigments in particular, I suppose the cadmiums through the late 19, very late 19th century and now, you know, alternatives again. But it's still available and we actually, you know, work with a, uh, a small company um, who are making those lead-based pigments or lead-based uh, yellows. Probably the most famous obsolete pigment or dye would be Tyrian purple. If it's the most famous because it was being used on Roman emperors and senators' togas. It was normally a small lining of color all the way through to the emperor. It may have been a whole cloak. It was made from the uh, a predatory sea snail, Brandaris bolinus. A little bit like with a squid or an octopus has, a, a, has an ink sac, which it gives out color. Tens of thousands of these sea snails had to basically be killed. The actual knowledge of it fell out of, um, out of use we, we lost the actual methods by which it was made for hundreds of years until really the last century in the 20th century we was reinvestigated and rediscovered. Now I'm working closely with a gentleman in North Africa who is trying to bring that industry back, but he's being much more sustainable about it. Whereas the Mexicans, instead of actually killing the, 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 the snails, they actually um, lift them off and milk them and then put them back onto the rocks. But unfortunately, that industry is being um, attacked by overfishing and we may see the end of that as well. So I'm sort of at the point where I'm discovering some colors being, re being brought back out of obsolescence and some potentially going into complete obsolescence. It's, it's an interesting time, um, but certainly that would, you know, that's a color I would love to see Tyrian purple brought back, maybe in a more sustainable way. In paint making, certain pigments do present some challenges with modern pigments because of their incredibly small size. Modern organic pigments are far, far tinier as a general rule compared to the inorganic pigments. Inorganic pigments are those which are drawn from a material that comes generally you know, from a mineral, uh, from a metal coming out of the ground. So all of the colors that you know, you'd be aware of. So titanium, iron to make the ochres, iron oxide, manganese, zinc, cadmium, cobalt. These are all inorganic colors. The organic colors, of course, are derived actually from the petrochemical industry in the sense of drawing out carbon chains from those, those raw materials, coal tar dyes, and actually re re um, rebuilding them into a synthetic color that can be stable and light fast and do all the things we wanted to do as, as paint makers because they're important for artists. And the most important one is that they obviously are light fast, they don't fade, that they operate in the binder very easily, that they stay stable. They don't react with other colors as well. And these were all issues for pigments in the past. Really, the, the, the biggest challenge we have with most of these pigments is the, as I said, in the organic pigments is their fineness and the fact that they naturally want to agglomerate. They want to stick together. They don't want to be separated from each other, to be dispersed in a binding and agent in in our case in linseed oil or safflower oil so a lot more effort is put into being able to do that because paint in the end is really a very simple material it's a coloring agent pigment and a binding agent in this case linseed oil we need to separate all the pigments from each other so that we can then coat each of those pigments individually in the oil and that means that then the pigments will stick together 
and we'll stick to the actual support we're painting onto, whether that's canvas or paper or board. Dioxazine violet in particular is uh, an extremely, uh, really quite difficult pigment to separate away from each other. But there are other challenges as well in regards to some pigments just have some quite strange qualities to them. Prussian blue, when we first start mixing it, it sounds like we are running powdered glass over the machine, through the machine. It has this extraordinary hiss of like, because it's a, the nature of how it's constructed, it's quite hard. And it actually, until we fully disperse it, until it's fully lubricated, as it were, the individual pigment particles running over the triple roll mill do get this kind of slightly abrasive sound and a kind of, as I said, a hiss as it runs through the machine. It's not damaging the machine, it's just kind of a little bit alarming because you think that you're doing something wrong. And you learn with experience how pigments in within the paint, as we develop the paint, how they actually alter not only in consistency, but also in the sounds. You, you, you would think it would be, you know, a very visual act in making paint, but actually there's quite a few um, qualities that we are looking for and listening for. Ultramarine blue, by its very nature, is one of the building blocks of synthetic modern ultramarine blue is sulfur. Normally you wouldn't smell that so sulfur, but when we're making in the paint and it's under quite a bit of stress as it's being run through, it's being dispersed and being slightly, there's a little bit of friction involved in the paint making process, sulfur is released. So you can smell a very faint smell of rotten eggs coming off the machine, which again, is just, it's a peculiarity. I see all the pigments as my children in the sense that some are good and some are naughty, uh, some are compliant and some are just, they just really are very, very stubborn. They don't want to do what we want them to do. I will make some paint from pigments I've never made before. Maybe we'll never turn them into a paint color, but I do it for my own obsessiveness, my own kind of, I'm just curious. Some pigments, as a general rule, inorganic pigments, the older pigments, as we mill them, they become looser. As they become lubricated by the oil, they start out as a very stiff paste, and then they become a smooth, buttery, softer paste. With organic colors, the modern pigments, because of their, their very, very tiny particle size, they actually have a lot of surface area. And as we mill them, they actually become stiffer. They become thicker. So we're always highly aware of what they are going to do. That's obviously what we really just keep an eye on. Um, and it's the individual peculiarities that I love about all of the, these different pigments. We'll often explain to people, you know, pigments are generally not made for artists, unfortunately. We don't, there's not enough money in art manufacture to drive a pigment manufacturer to work, make a pigment purely for our industry. They are making it for much larger industries. Often pigments have been introduced with the idea that they were going to be a fantastic, you know, solution for a particular industry. And a good example would be manganese blue. Manganese blue was a pigment that was introduced in the, about 1933, and it was going to be a cement color. It was highly stable in very alkali solution. So cement is very alkali. And so it was meant to be the, the new blue that would be stable, very light fast, and very secure in that, that actual solution. It didn't have enormous tinting strength, which for as artists, we quite like. You know, we sometimes like the subtlety of, of a pigment, but unfortunately for industry, it really didn't um, hold up. And in the 1970s, basically, the companies that were making manganese blue decided to stop manufacture. The cobalts were basically far higher specification for its applications industrially. Other colors get made in particular for things like the auto industry. A lot of the modern pigments like the quinacridones, because they're transparent, they're perfectly, and they're very, very light uh, fast. So of course, if you imagine for cars, which are outside all the time with extraordinary conditions, cold, um, ice, uh, sun, heat, cold, you know, everything that goes on. So they have to be really, really high, high performance. But the problem again is that if a car maker has specified a color for their cars and then decides finally due to fashion, more than anything else, fashion, that they don't want to use that color anymore, then basically often that's the only reason it was being made was for an auto coating or for a cosmetic co colorant. And if it's not being wanted by, for those industries anymore, the pigment manufacturer will stop making it. And that's true of something like, uh, you know, quinacridone gold. The color cobalt teal went out of production with a couple of manufacturers because they were making it for um, auto coatings, a beautiful kind of retro 
You could imagine American cars with that fantastic cobalt teal color. It went out of production because one of the car makers in the States, the United States stopped manufacturing, didn't want that color anymore. And so production kind of ceased or halted or certainly put on hiatus. Luckily for all of us, it's come back again because uh, I can't tell you how many people love cobalt teal. It's that beautiful color that's kind of full of sunshine. Really, all I can say is we are always going to be at the mercy of bigger industries. We can always hope that <clears throat> they will hang in there, but we have to be aware of those kind of issues. Sometimes we think something's going to be difficult and we will hoard it so that we have two, three years worth of supply just in case. Uh, and sometimes it just catches us by surprise. especially with the modernists of the 20th century, um, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, with artists that were very bold with colour. They were, they were making full use of the brand new colours of that time, which were the cadmiums and the cobalts. Those colours weren't available to artists until really the, the mid to late 19th century. I would love to have been able to give Matisse um, both video blue and video green, just super opaque, super bright colours and see them as large swathes, almost um, walls of color by which they could have then played around with other devices on top of. The other artist would be Bonnard, Pierre Bonnard. He was such a master of color that I'm not certain really he would need any more help from a paint maker. I have some couple of colors again I would love to have been able to give to him for him to have been able to play around with, in particular our Pyrrhol Red and our Pyrrhol Orange, um, even just as a starting point. But they're so powerful and potent and chromatically true primaries and secondaries. The list, of course, could go on forever. Um, but as I said, those would be probably my first, my first artist. I'd just, you know, knock on the studio door, see whether you want some Henry. I reckon you should have this a go. I'd give this a go, so you'll never know. I suppose the one now in regards to colours that are in general use, and the reason I'm saying that is because the, the lead-based pigments are generally, it's still, they're still available. Flake white is still available and it's an extraordinary white, but it's obviously in limited supply. It's one of those, those pigments that unfortunately is only going to get more and more limited due to legislations. In general, more broad use, I suppose cobalts would be the biggest issue, and that's twofold. The first, would be there is always a danger that cobalt um, ore can be drawn from a conflict region. Company, and I would expect most paint makers would be doing the same. We're working from manufacturers of cobalt blue and other cobalt colors, but you now obviously in particular cobalt blue pigments, um, and have we have uh, certified lines of supply that are absolutely non-conflict, and they can come from those areas. But obviously there's always the danger that it doesn't. The second thing is that cobalts are a toxic material in some ways, and they can be broken down to become a toxic chemical. And for that reason, again, disposal is important. We don't want to get it into the environment. So I would normally recommend to let them harden, dry up, whether it's an acrylic or harden, oxidize, if it's an oil color, and then dispose of correctly with your local council. As I said, with oil paints, well, the binder is a natural renewable resource, if you like. It's a, it's, it's, it's linseed is grown and we express the oil from the seeds. So we don't have an issue there. And also linseed does not use vast quantities of water, doesn't use vast quantities of pesticides. It's a very hardy plant. Um, and as I said, within most of the pigments, they're, they're, they're pretty, um, they're, they're pretty, they're virtually non-impact materials, especially because of course really the art material industry is so small, our use of it is so low on impact. But we all want to make a difference. And as I said, that would be probably something just to keep be aware of. Don't flush things down the sink. I think there's a little bit of misinformation floating around. For a start, we are legally obligated as all color suppliers to offer what's known as a SDS, a safety data sheet. And so we work through a thing called the Global Harmonization Scheme, which is a UN-based international uh, regulatory body 
by which we have to work to those standards and the way we set out the safety data sheets. And we obviously also have to investigate by putting in the chemical constitutions. And then we will know whether or not it's toxic or non-toxic, hazardous or non-hazardous. Cadmium pigments are considered non-toxic, non-hazardous. And the reason is that we're talking about cadmium pigments for artists. Cadmium pigments for artists are built in a very particular way, which is different from other materials derived from cadmium. Now, cadmium as an ore is a toxic material, but we're not working with raw cadmium. We're work working with a highly comp complex material that's being constructed out of that raw material. And also, cadmium pigments, like many pigments, also have often an, an inert coating, an encapsulation of some sort, normally a silica. And these materials also help in regards to, one, the dispersing when we're making a paint, but they also help in regards to if one was to get cadmium into your system, it will pass through your system without attacking the vital organs. As I said, you know, we get asked more about cadmium pigments really interestingly than any other. And yet, in fact, they're not a pigment we should be worrying about in the same way that we should be worrying about maybe cobalt pigments or lead-based pigments in particular. I would never recommend really, of course, anyone getting color into their system. Good studio practice will help. Just, you know, looking after yourself. If you really are concerned, obviously you can wear gloves or you can wear a barrier cream, but really artist materials are pretty benign and cadmiums are within that area. They are, they are pretty, you know, they are safe, especially as I said, because they're built for a very specific function for us as artists. Not only obviously do I want to offer more colors and we uh, are definitely releasing eight new colors. The other thing though, is we're very interested now in reclam um, reclamation of color. It's been started overseas in the United States and, and in the UK. And we're working with a uh, company that's looking at taking color out of contaminated spaces. And in particular, we're looking at uh, waterways, streams and rivers that have been contaminated with iron oxide. Um, it's choking up the rivers, it's killing the actual aquatic life. And there's processes now by which we can actually withdraw, draw out the iron from the waterways, cleaning them up. And we can actually take that iron oxide and through a couple of small steps, turn it into a ochre pigment. And then we would like to be able to reintroduce that back into our color lines. And so we basically end up with a closed circle. We can actually clean the waterways, bring that material, it doesn't get dumped, it actually gets used, that's important, and used by artists who are not going to use vast quantities and again, harm the earth. Most artist oil mediums are based on natural oils, linseed, walnut, safflower, poppy. And again, so this is actually a, you know, sustainable material. So as I said, you know, we will continue to try and be diligent guardians um, and we will be striving to continue that on behalf of the planet and on behalf of our customers and just on behalf of our own sort of self-belief in what's, what's good to do.